Let me tell a, a couple of quick stories. Um, first, um, we have my um, my three children. My, my youngest daughter, Catherine, is 18. She graduates next week. And our dog, Nessie, is an Australian Shepherd. And she's like 15. And she's getting old and she can barely get around. We've got her on heart medicine and glucosamine. And, um, but she's she's she thinks she's their mother. And so anyway, she she just whenever they all come together and you know come back, two two oldest kids will come back home and then Catherine's there. She Nessie's just all fired up about it, but she doesn't have the stamina, but she just wants to be inside. And her one great fear is to be taken to the vet. I don't know why, but but one day um I just decided the kids were gone and she was a little bit depressed and I decided, well, I'm just going to put her in my trooper and we're going to, I got to run a few errands and she can just ride with me. We can get, you know, get her outside. And so I put her in the car and she's looking around Then she got down on the floorboard and I drove around and I did my errands and the whole time. She was just shaking the whole time. She just, she just knew I was going to take her to the vet <laughs> and I was going to drop her off. And you know, why would you do that to me? I've been such a good dog. And so we drove around, you know, and did a few things. And if I came back to the house and opened the door, and she just is looking at me like, what, no vet? <laughs> and and so anyway, she got out, went on inside, and and the Lord sort of sort of spoke to me and said, Nessie's a lot like life, isn't she? That we're so afraid of what might happen to us or what might not happen that we sit around spending most of our times like this the whole time, and we don't get to enjoy anything that's right in front of us right now today. Uh, and I just thought, okay, Lord, okay. I am a classic um, overachiever. And I, um, I I give you, let me, let me tell you a couple of other stories about me just in my life to help you understand a little bit about where I come from. My grandmother uh, was four feet 10. Uh, she said four feet 11, but we think it's more like four nine when she had her high heels on. And she was a highly educated woman, very brilliant. And we called her Napoleon behind her back. My brothers and my cousin uh, never in front of her face because she, you know, what grandmama said went. And her husband was six foot five. My dad's a pretty big man and we were all pretty big, but whatever, grandmama. Anyway, she loved education. And she, um, she herself was a teacher and she loved education. So she'd made sure that, that me and my two brothers and my sister had uh, educational opportunities if we wanted to pursue them. Anyway, when I finally graduated from the University of Aberdeen, having studied with J.B. Torrance, I came back home. My wife and I came back home for the, a couple of weeks and brought our kids. And so my grandmother, I was staying with my parents. And my grandmother called me on the phone. She said, Baxter, she said, I want to see your Ph.D. certificate. Do you have it with you? And I said, yes. As a matter of fact, she called me in Scotland and said, make sure and bring it. She wanted to see it. So anyway, so I, I dutifully go down to Grandmama's house with my Ph.D. certificate in hand. And she's sitting on her couch and I open it up and she looked at it and she started crying. And I said, well, Grandma, I said, she said, this is one of the proudest days of my life. And I said, well, I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. She said, um, I've got something I want to tell you. I said, OK. She said, when you were little. Uh, the house that I grew up in was the house that she grew up in, which was the house that her father, who was the county doctor in my small town, built on the corner of First Street and Main Street. Now, you're getting a little idea about why I'm an overachiever, aren't you? The county doctor, one of the last things he did before he died was hold his second grandson, great-grandson named Baxter. Anyway, when my grandmother got married, he built them a house that backed up to his on, on, the, on the block took up half the city block. So our backyards met and her back uh, her kitchen window looked out toward our and she said she said she walked me over to her kitchen window and she said you you see up at the old house she said, yes ma'am she said you see those stairs and I said those steps I said yes ma'am she said when you were little you would sit on those steps right by yourself for hours at a time and she said do you remember that and I said no and she said I would be here in the kitchen and I would see you just sitting there right by yourself. So she said, one day I just decided I had to know. I had to know what you were thinking about. So I came up, I walked up through the yard and I sat down beside you on the steps. And she said, do you remember this? I said, Grandma, I don't remember this. And she said, well, we talked. 
And we talked for a little while. And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, and I finally said, bless his heart, he's just dumb. <laughs> she said, every family's got one. We're, we're just going to have to take care of him. <laughs> I kid you not. So she's holding my PhD certificate. And she said, you're the first for person from the family that, that's got a degree from Europe. And this is one of the proudest days of my life. And my old dumb grandson made it. You know, <laughs> She didn't say that part. Um, my mother has a different interpretation. I, I don't remember much of this. I do remember when I was little, I would swing. In our front porch swing. I love swinging. And my mother said she never worried about it because she could hear it squeaking. And when it quit squeaking, she knew I was either getting in trouble or I'd gone to sleep. And she would just look out the window and I'd usually be laid over like this sleeping. But anyway, um, my mother, my mother tells me, she says, you don't realize this. And she, when, when I decided to go and study theology, it was a shock to me. The last thing in the universe I wanted to do was be in church ministry. Uh, and it's certainly in theology because that stuff's like reading religious insurance manuals. <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, come on. I mean, I got a whole lot better things I want to do with my life than sit around in that world. But when the Lord finally got a hold of me, I just I became consumed and fascinated. And my mother says, this is not surprising to me. And I said, what are you talking about? She said, you've been this way your whole life. You, you've always read the Bible and studied and struggled. And I said, I don't remember any of that. I remember playing baseball and going to crawfish boils and riding my bicycle and doing things, that made, playing golf that most kids did. But she said, you've always been this way. And as I look back, there's one moment in my church life that really I can see now was a huge moment for me. I didn't realize this for years and years. You know how you look back and see things that happened. And at the moment, you didn't maybe didn't even notice it. But it was a Sunday morning in my in my little Presbyterian church, which was very conservative, very Calvinistic. Uh, and I had learned the catechism and I had done all the things. And I was sitting on the third pew on the left as you come down the aisle from the pulpit. It's on the right because that is where my great granddaddy sat and he built the church. <laughs> Y'all don't know anything about that kind of thing, do you? Anyway, so I was sitting there, my two brothers, my mama. My dad and, and all the men folk were outside this church. Maybe there, there may have been 50 people in, in the congregation that morning. But all the men folk sat out, stood outside and you could hear them laughing. And they were all having their, their last cigarette before my Aunt Polly, who played the piano, the, the organ, she'd be playing along the music and then she would hit it and, and hit the volume on it. And though the, the folks, I mean, the men outside realized it's time to go in. And I remember sitting there trying to be still and trying to be quiet because we're supposed to be here to worship God. And I'm listening to my father and my best friend's father, whose name was Lewis Williams, and everybody called him Tut. He had the most distinctive laugh in the world. Never heard anything like it ever since. And I could hear them laughing. And so I turned and watched them come through the, the door. And Aunt Polly hit the music, and now it got real in earnest because now we're really going to worship God. And my dad was smiling, and Tut Williams and some other men were right behind him, and they suddenly went ghostly white and stepped across the threshold and walked, came and sat down, not a word, nothing. And we worshiped God, and we did the Sunday service. And then when we walked out, as soon as we stepped out, they were all lighting up the cigarettes and laughing again. And I, I remember sitting there in the pew thinking, there is something really wrong here because I know those men and I know everyone in this church. They're good people, but there's something really wrong here. And so my basic idea of God was some, I was in conflict early on in my life. I knew better. I knew that God was not sterile, that he was not boring. The catechism, child's catechism that I grew up with says, what is man's chief end? You ever heard of that? Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. It's beautiful, isn't it? And I thought, but my dilemma was, how can you glorify, enjoy anything if what you're doing is glorifying God? Because God is this, is what we do in the church. And it's not, you leave your humanity at the door. You leave your humanity at the door. You leave your laughter. You leave your humor. You leave your personality at the door and you get really, sort of stone-faced, and you come in and we're going to worship God. I didn't realize it, uh, but that was a burr under my saddle 
from early on in my life that I had this question. I know that God is supposed to be good. And he's not supposed to be scary. I know that God is supposed to be love. But this whole event we called Sunday morning was more like everybody was rigid. Everything had to be perfect. If ain't Polly, bless her heart, made a mistake, then everybody just went. <gasps> and I thought this is I couldn't see it. You know, I was too young. I didn't have enough experience. I didn't have enough historical. Re- I just couldn't see it. But I knew in my guts that there is something desperately wrong here. Not with the people. I'm not I'm not talking about, you know, I'm not talking about people. And I'm not even talking about our pastor because I he's still at the church. He's still a great man. He's done wonderful things in the community. I'm just talking about our perspective and the way we get so serious when all of a sudden we think we're coming into the presence of God. And and I was reading this review recently of um, of the book, The Shack. Y'all know that book? Yeah. Well, you just hang on. There's one coming called The Shack Revisited that a real close friend of mine wrote. Uh, as a matter of fact, he may have a copy with him. Uh, it's not in print yet, but it's coming. But I was reading this review and this guy says the very idea and he's in the book, the very idea of saying a curse word in the presence of God, because at some point in, he said something that he called the murderer. And I thought, you see, where can you go in this universe where you're not in the presence of God? What is he talking about? Every curse word is a curse word in the presence of God, as is every sin and every form of brokenness and everything that we think we're hiding and do it. What is he? You see, and I'm thinking, oh, man, we have a serious doctrine of God issue here. What we have is God's on a throne up there and he's watching us and he's already disapproving of us. So he's watching us with a disapproving heart and he's not sure that he likes us. He hasn't made up his mind about us yet. And he talks about loving us on the one hand, but we know there's another side of God. Don't we? They can get a hold of us and send us to the flames in a heartbeat. So we've got this vision that we've inherited in our family conversation. And it doesn't matter if you're in the worldwide church of God. It doesn't matter if you don't, if you've never been to church. If you're human, you got these blinders on. And this takes us all the way back to, to the fall of Adam. And maybe tomorrow we'll have some time to talk about that. We'll see um, how far we get in the conversation. But we think of God as on a throne and he's distant and he's watching us. You know, he's watching us from a distance, as the song says. And we think he's good. We say he's good, but but we know better. We're holding our breath. And at some point, you just give up. And so anyway, in my journey, I was like wrestling with, I couldn't put my finger on. I didn't understand because the, the Presbyterian world that I grew up in, they had everything supported with Bible verses. I mean, there's, it was airtight. Y'all don't know anything about that, do you? <laughs> <laughs> You guys even include you guys even include the Old Testament in all of your your quotations. And so I was really wrestling and really wrestling. And when I was in college, I had some breakthroughs that really got me going. But um, in my senior year in college at the University of Mississippi, um, I discovered a library. There was a library there. I didn't even know it. The University of Mississippi is not known for, well, it is a very academic school, but it's also known for having a big time. We have a, we had a large time every day. But anyway, my senior year, uh, the Lord began to reveal himself to me in new ways. And I find myself going to the library trying to find a book by Athanasius called the, On the Incarnation of the Word of God. And only Last year, did I discover how I found out about that book when I was a senior in college? I was uh, working on my new book and I was doing some research in C.S. Lewis and I came across God in the Dock. Do you all know that book? And I was thumbing through it and I had underlined a quotation that was a foot that was footnoted to Athanasius. And so I thought, I want to read this guy. So I go to the library at the University of Mississippi and they had it. They had Athanasius and I and had never been checked out. And I, I promised myself at some point when I'm up there, I'm going to go back and check just to see if anybody's checked it out since. <laughs> but they had Athanasius and I'm sitting there reading Athanasius. Now, I didn't know that when he wrote this, he was 21 years old and I knew that he was he was older. You know, he was from way back. But I really didn't know that he was the dude that wrote Nicene Creed virtually. And I didn't realize that he almost single-handedly saved the Christian church from Greek philosophy. 
not not alone, but with other brothers. I didn't know all that. I'm just reading. And here's what Athanasius said. Two things. Get this. The God of all is good and supremely noble by nature. Therefore, he is the lover of the human race. You see that? The God of all is good and is supremely noble by nature. Therefore, he is the lover of the human race. I mean, you're talking about a statement that rocked my world. And then I read on in his little treatise on the incarnation of the word of God, again, which was written when he was 21 years old or right about there. And he <laughs> said, he says, what then was God being good to do? When his creation was on the road to ruin and lapsing back into non-being. Was he to walk away and throw his hands up? You see, you have, I think we have, but by virtue of the fact that we're human and by virtue of the fact that we're part of a larger Western conversation, we have two different gods in our minds. One is that God sits up on the throne, high and exalted and lifted up. And is disapproving, is watching us, and is keeping tabs, and there's going to be a reckoning. And this God is not fundamentally for us. He may be, if if his blood sugar gets right, but he is not, by nature, he's not fundamentally for us. Maybe if Jesus twists his arm, and maybe if we hang around Jesus, he won't. But there's something there that's ambiguous. There's something there that's just... Uh, at best neutral, at worst, he's not for us. And then we have the witness of the Holy Spirit within us. And the witness of the Holy Spirit within us is that God is Father, Son, and Spirit. And this God is good. This God is beautiful. This God, as Father, Son, and Spirit, love one another. And they relate to you and relate to me and relate to the human race out of the way they relate together. So, Do you see any neutrality or ambiguity in the way the Father loves Jesus? Is Jesus holding his breath, hoping today that my Father doesn't morph back into that God sitting up on the throne and I get banished? Is Jesus saying, I hope I get everything right today so I can get God's blessings? And what kind of love does the Father have for his Son? It's unconditional. It's I love you. I am with you. I got you. I share all things with you. And you think, well, here's the issue. Here's the the first critical issue for us to think about. Does Jesus' Father relate to you in and through and with the way he relates to his son? Or does he kind of go, Jesus, we have a good thing going. That's fine. But I'm going to relate to people over here another way. You see, the question here is, do the Father, Son, and Spirit have two lives? Do they have the life that they share together, which is full of love and laughter and humor and beauty and goodness? And then they have a second life over here where they morph into a different kind of God. And that's the kind of God that's looking at us. You see, it's a huge question because once you begin to see this, it's like this. These two different gods begin to end up in two different theologies and they begin to end up in two different ways of reading the Bible and two different ways of reading the Old Testament, New Testament, two different ways of seeing who Jesus is, two different understandings of why Jesus died on the cross, two different re- understandings of what the Christian life is all about, of who we are, why we're on this planet, two different ways of looking at what God thinks about me. So to me, the great breakthrough in my life and my journey came when I was studying with Professor Torrance. I'm skipping over a bunch of stuff, but we come back to it. Um, and I begin to realize that God is Father, Son, and Spirit. And Athanasius says the Holy Trinity is no created thing. There was never a time when the Father was alone without his Son and just God. Now, you know what that means? That means that God has always been familial. This is the original family. And that in this circle of life shared by the Father, Son, and Spirit, there's no hierarchy. It's not like the Father's up on a little bit bigger throne than Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Who knows where the Holy Spirit fits? No, it's three persons face to face. It's three persons who love each other. It's three persons who share life and enjoy themselves and enjoy one another. And that's the way they are. And that's the way they've always been. And that's the way they're always going to be. 
And you begin to think that's what Jesus was trying to help us to see. I've come to tell you who my father really is so that you can know him. You can know who he is and what he's really like. And as you know, my father, you begin to know that you're loved and you didn't cause that love. That love is uncaused. That love is eternal. It's in the relationship of the Father, Son, and Spirit. And this God is not watching you to see if you perform right and get it right so he can decide if he's going to bless you. This God loves you from all eternity and will never stop no matter what happens because this God is love. Or you can flip it over here and go back to the God up on the throne who's watching you with two different eyes. And then we think, well, I know. And that leads straight into what I call the yes, but shuffle. You know, yes, I hear all this Trinitarian thing and I get this, but we know better. I mean, we got passages in the book that we got underlined where he's, he's got a 55 gallon drum and you know what, and he's liable to come on, on us any minute. How, so they're questions, biblical questions. But ultimately, one of the things that I'm trying to raise here is who is God and what God, what is God really like and what can we count on? What can we count on? Can we count on God? Can we count on God's character? Well, you cannot count on a char- uh, the character of God if God is fundamentally two different people in the sense of this, this judge who's watching us from a distance and impossibly someday. That's almost like a drunk, isn't it? Isn't that about what that is? I mean, you know, the drunk just beats the, you know, what out of his children the next day. He says, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And he tries to make everything right. And they know, yeah, yeah, yeah. But tomorrow you're going to be back here. I mean, what does that produce in your soul? Does that produce hope? Does that produce a sense of self-worth? I mean, does that produce any value at all? I mean, we're kind of, and that's what that God is. And we've got Bible verses to prove it, don't we? So we're going to sort through this weekend somehow we got there, where that comes from, and sort through um, the beauty and the relationship of the Father, Son, and Spirit so that we can begin to see the eternal character of God. <coughs> I mean, do we think don't you you love your children? You'd lay down your life for your children and grandchildren, wouldn't you? I mean, you wouldn't even think about it, would you? Now, that puts us in an unusual position. Does that mean that we actually love our children better than that God loves us? I mean, you know better, but there we are. We're looking at well, this God doesn't love us that way. So that's the importance, very beginning of our discussion, the importance of thinking about the fact that this relationship of the Father, Son, and Spirit is really beautiful and good, and that's the foundation of the whole universe and the foundation of your existence and mine while we're here. Let me tell you another story. Um, on my 12th birthday or thereabouts in November, um, my, my mother and father gave me the best present I ever got, which was a trip to New Orleans, which is about a three-hour drive to New Orleans from Prentice, my little small town of Prentice. And we were going to see the Minnesota Vikings play the New Orleans Saints. And I'm not real sure even to this day how I was such a, a rabid Minnesota Vikings fan, but I was at 12 years old. I knew all the players. I knew where they went to college and I knew all their statistics, you know. And then we watched them, me and my, my best friend, Mark Williams, we were Viking fans and we watched them. So they gave, they took me and my two brothers and Mark Williams and we went down to New Orleans to see the Vikings play in person. At Tulane Stadium. It's long before the Superdome. So we got down there and we parked the car and it took forever and ever to get there. I mean, you know, you can imagine you're 12 years old and you got to ride three hours. It's like it's like driving to Grand Junction from Mississippi. (laughs) So anyway, we get to New Orleans and we take the trolley car from where we parked over to the stadium and we get there. And we get seated and the Viking players come out. And this is way back in the days when they were great. And the Saints, we call Kinks or Aints or whatever. <laughs> Blessedly, times have changed now. Anyway, the game was a rout as we expected it would be. And it was a beautiful day. And it was just like everything a 12-year-old boy dreamed. Got to see his team in person. And after the game was over, we were walking down the, the exit ramp. And I looked over and I saw three buses. And I saw the Viking players themselves getting on the buses. I could not believe it. And so I ran down. This was long before all the, the um, you know, police escort. I mean, they probably escort, but there was, the security was nowhere near like it is today. And I actually walked right up to the buses and I shook hands with uh, with uh, Wally Hilgenberg and I saw Alan Page and, and Carl Eller. 
in person dudes were huge, man. They were this, this huge guy. And of course, I'm like this. At, you know. Anyway, I shook hands with him. Coach Bud Grant himself was this close to me, and he leaned over to sign an autograph, and his hat fell on the ground. And I'm like, whoa, and I got it, and I picked it up, and I handed it back to him. Coach Bud Grant, this close. I mean, I was so blown away, I didn't even think about getting an autograph. It was just, I was thinking, man. And then the three buses, the stadium, I remember, went round like this, and there was a little alleyway, and then there was some hedgerow and some big trees, and the buses were there. And then one by one, the Viking players got on, and the buses drove off down that little alleyway. And the last bus went down and turned left and disappeared. And I suddenly realized that I had no idea where my parents were. I had never told them what I was doing. I didn't even know where I was. They didn't know where I was. I didn't know where they were. And so the greatest of all fears seized my little heart. It was absolute panic. It was just panic. I didn't have a clue what to do. And I remember turning around and there was not another human being in sight. You could see under the stadium, under the, in the walkways and there was not, there weren't even any vendors there. I'm thinking, what, how could that be? And I thought, well, find a policeman. So I went trying to find a policeman. I didn't see another human being. There were houses all around, but I had enough sense to know, you know, don't don't go into somebody's strange house in New Orleans. So I walked around the stadium two or three times trying to find some somebody, and I couldn't, and I was crying my eyes out. I thought, man, well, you had a great day. You know, <laughs> you had your one day. This is it. You're going to be kidnapped, and who knows? And I was scared. I, I can I can close my eyes and, and see the scenes right now, 40-something years later. I can see the concrete. I can see the flickering light. I can smell the concrete and hear the leaves rustling. So I walked around the stadium a couple of times, and I finally decided I had some change in my pocket, and I thought, well, we came to the stadium on the trolley car. I got to get on the trolley car. Maybe I can see my parents. Who knows? So I got on and told the man, the driver, I said, sir, I'm lost. So we came to the stadium on the trolley car. I don't know. He said, which one? I said, I don't have a clue. And he said, well, did you come from the north or the east? I said, <laughs> said we live in Mississippi. And uh, he said, well, get on the back of the trolley car. And if you see anything, there's a little cable here. Just pull the cable and I'll stop. So I got in the back and I would press my face against this window and then go to that side, hoping that I would see a, a tree or a street sign or a car who knows you know maybe maybe actually see my mom and dad or maybe my best friend mark williams or i didn't know i was just hoping against hope that i would see something somewhere and anyway we drove all the way around the circuit and the driver said son we're back at the stadium what do you want to do and i didn't know what to do so i said well i'll get off and i got off and i walked down that alleyway that the bus had exited from and i sat down in the pile of leaves by those two big oak trees and tried to cry, but I couldn't even cry anymore. And then all of a sudden I'm sitting there and the stadium lights go off. Man, it's dark. I mean, there's, there's darkness and then there's concrete darkness, you know, this scary darkness. And it was dark and I was scared to death and I'm, oh Lord, if you'll get me out of this one, I'll go be a preacher. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll go to Grand Junction and t- <laughs> I don't remember making any promises except except I really really prayed hard and cried and, and I don't know how long I sat there but it certainly seemed like every bit as long as the eternal ride to the stadium from my hometown and I was sitting there and I was crying and there were no more t- tears and I was fiddling with a stick in the ground and all of a sudden the lights of the stadium were turned on and I thought, somebody turn those on and I will find them. And so I got up and I started running down that road to try to get around the stadium to find my way in, to find out who turned it on when I heard the most blessed word I had ever heard in my entire life. One word. Baxter! <laughs> Shouted by my dad. It stopped me dead in my tracks. And... Nobody had to tell me how to apply that word to my life. I didn't need a Presbyterian subcommittee to give me instructions. I didn't need a hierarchical religious system to give me instructions. That my name shouted by my father spoke the hope of a thousand volumes. Instantly, it baptized my soul 
with hope, with peace, with assurance, with rest. And all that fear and all that anxiety and all that stuff that had just driven me crazy for four or five hours, like those buses, it just exited. And I stopped and I turned around and I saw my dad. And he came and gave me a big hug. And uh, he said, I'm, you know, I said, ooh, man. He said, well, you okay? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, your mama's going to kill you now. So, <laughs> no. <laughs> she's, she sometimes is at conferences, if I'll tell that story, she says, you don't ever tell them what I was feeling the whole time you were like, <laughs> you know. Anyway, years later, I realized that that event in my life, that trauma, is also a living parable just riddled with lessons. Um, two lessons are really important. I want to talk about just for a minute. One is that this story is really not just about me lost in New Orleans. It is a living parable of the human race. We don't know who we are while we're here. We're lost. We're scared to death. We're on the streetcar. And we're going round and round in circles. And we're looking it for anything, anywhere that will give us some sign of hope, some sign of peace, some sign of meaning and belonging. And so we spend so much of our time going from this thing to the next, just hoping that we can find something somewhere. And the streetcar is called scared to death, but we can't look at it. We can't even acknowledge it. So some of us sitting on the streetcar believe we got it all figured out and everything's just fine. <laughs> and others have found ways to entertain themselves. Others have found ways to stay drunk in one musical way or another, stay busy, stay whatever. But whenever there's a bump or a strange noise, everybody on the bus looks up hoping they're going to see something that reminds them of home. That's the story. That's what that's about. And the second, the second lesson for me is that it is a living picture of the absolute simplicity of Christian life. When it's all said and done, it boils down to one thing, and that is hearing Jesus' Father shout your name. Are you with me? And it baptizes your soul with unearthly assurance, with an assurance that's rooted in the character of God. And that assurance gives you rest. And when you begin to rest inside, do you know what you become then? What do you do when you're afraid inside? What are you focused on? You're focused on yourself, aren't you? Well, what do you do if you're not afraid inside? You begin to notice people around you are crying. People around you on the trolley car are scared. You see, just one little thing. If, if we could reach in and take fear out of everybody's soul, just that one thing, just take fear out and move it over here, and give people rest and some sense of assurance, then all of us can begin to be less self-centered and more other-centered, which sounds an awful lot like not the God on the throne up in the sky, but an awful lot like the Father, Son, and Spirit and the way they go about stuff. When my wife and I were married, um, we had not been married too long, but she told me that, um, that she said, you're the most self self-centered person I've ever known. And I said, I know. Not argue, but I don't know how not to be. And the way we can move out of self-centeredness is by the removal of fear. And the only thing that's powerful enough and has enough weight or authority with your soul to remove fear is that baptism that comes when we hear Jesus' Father shout our names. You with me? And then that begins to create fellowship and community, and we hadn't even tried to do anything yet. You, your inner world begins to be calmed down. You then begin to notice others. And when you're afraid inside, or even when you're hurting inside, then people become things that you use to try to help you solve your problem. That's the way we are. Our pain applies itself to our lives and our relationships without our even knowing it. People then, then uh, children are, are there for our benefit. Uh, one year... Uh, I was parked at a stop, stopped at a red light, and uh, I was sitting in my little Honda Accord that had been donated to our ministry. It had air conditioning, but my other car didn't, or it didn't work. 
And I was fired up because this is, it was like July and this is really working. And I'm just sitting there in my own little world, one mile from my house. And this lady pulls up beside me. I don't know what car. She was either Mercedes or a BMW or something. It was a nice big car. And I'm sitting there and I look over at her and she looks over at me and rolls her eyes like this and turns and drives off. And by the time that I got from that red light to my house, which was one mile, I was fit to be tied inside. My insides were like a box of loose coat hangers. I walked in the house. My three children are there watching TV. My wife's cooking supper on the phone. I walk in the house. My children don't even acknowledge that I'm there. My wife's too busy. She's, she didn't see me. So I said, Pfft. I got out. Got up, walked out, got in the car and drove around for a few minutes and came back, tried to cool down. And I walked in. The kids say, hey, Dad. Walked in to Beth and she's still on the phone cooking supper. And she looks at me. She says, what's wrong? And I said, nothing. <laughs> y'all, y'all don't know anything about that, do you? You see, that whole conflict that happened between that look, which probably didn't mean anything, but I took it to mean a lot about me. And about what I'm not. And if you were half a man, you'd have three cars and a big old house and a limousine and millions of dollars and all the stuff that we, we believe in the United States or in the West. And so all of a sudden my children ceased being children who were there for me to love and to, and to share life with. And they now became objects who existed for one reason and that was to help me. And they failed. They didn't even acknowledge me. You see? And my wife ceased to be a woman that I love, that I share life with. And I walked in there and it was only about me. And she didn't notice me. And so I left in anger. And as it, it, it came, it came back around to where I had to begin to realize what was going on inside of me. That's what fear, that's what shame, that's what hurt, that's what pain does to us. It makes us self-centered. And then we become users. And then our relationships begin to fall apart. And we don't know why. Even though we may be doing everything right. You see, I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't run the red light. I didn't speed going home. I was there with my family. I did nothing wrong. But what was going on internally was creating great uh, uh, pain in me. And then I became a user. And that was wrong. But how many, how, where does that appear? You know, where, where do you hear sermons on that? You know what I'm saying? In our, in our Entrapped as we are in some of our legalisms. Anyway, the solution to this and the solution to this and the solution to my dog, Nessie, being able to get in the car and just enjoy the ride is to trust me that I mean her no harm. I would never hurt her. Then no matter where we're going on this journey, she knows that I'm going to take care of her, that she knows that I love her. And the solution for you and for me and for the whole human race is that we begin to learn to trust Jesus' Father so that when he shouts our name, it does that baptism. It, it baptizes our souls with hope and with unearthly assurance and with peace. Because then you can play. Then you're free to be a father and love your children for their sakes. Then you're free to love your wife for her benefit, not for what you need to get from her or love your husband. Or to love your friends, or maybe to love your country, or to love your church, or to love people around you. Because it's no longer about me, it's now about them. And you have a room full of people who are trying to help each other in that freedom. I think that's what Jesus meant when he said the river of living water will well up within your souls and flow out. The problem is that, you know the story of Huck Finn, Huckleberry Finn? His dad was a drunk. And he was mean as a snake. And when he called Huckleberry Finn's name, Huckleberry Finn hauled because he knew what was coming. And it wasn't good. Now, who really wants to hear Huck Finn call their name? Who really wants to hear that God sitting up there with his disapproving frown call your name? Who really wants to go be in heaven with that God? I mean, that, I think most of us or most people, it's not heaven we want. It's to, to avoid hell. But what kind of heaven would it be if Huck Finn's dad is on the throne and at any moment can have a temper tantrum and wipe out half the population? 
What kind of what kind of father is that? And who wants to be around that father? I think that's what's going on inside of us. It's like, well, yeah, but I mean, we're kind of in, a, in between a rock and a hard place here. We don't want to burn in hell, but we don't want to go to heaven either. I mean, that's, I'm being really honest here, and you know that. I mean, that's why I sometimes do this in conferences. I'll ask people this question. How many of you, if you knew right now, if I could, if I could give you a ticket right now, said to you, you have 10,000 more years guaranteed living exactly the same life you have right now. How many of you would take that ticket? <laughs> people are always, people are always saying, Baxter, you know, you sound like a universalist. You, do you believe in hell? And that, uh huh. I think that's where we are. Jesus says, I have come to give as the light of the world that you may not remain in your darkness. And darkness is not a fun place. It's a scary place. And it creates self-centeredness and it creates a devastation of relationships. And that's the most miserable thing in the world. It's broken relationships. That's the beginnings of hell. So we have a problem on our hands. And I just want you to see this. We have a problem on our hands is that we, we desperately are wired to hear Jesus' Father call our name. And when we hear it and believe it, it does wonderful things inside of us, but we can't believe it. We can't believe it. We can't believe it because we got two gods and we don't know which one's really calling. And even if it's Jesus' Father, we're still afraid this one is bigger and better and going to show up and really cause a shot. You with me? So we're doing that yes but shuffle and we cannot receive the medicine of Papa's love that all of our souls desperately need. So, back a little bit to a part of my journey. I knew early on something was desperately wrong. I had no idea what it was. And then I discovered Athanasius. The God of all is good and supremely noble by nature. Therefore, he is the lover of the human race. You see? So at that moment in my life, I became somewhat aware of the fact that there's two different gods in the equation here. And so now the question on the table is which one's really God and which one are you you actually going to go for? And then you read on that what then is God being good to do when his creation is on the road to ruin? Is he to walk away? You see, if it's the other God that's the real creator, then his response to Adam's fall and to our sin is, I knew it. Jesus, I shouldn't have ever let you talk me into creating this, this sorry lot. Look what they've done and they've offended me. You can go fix it if you want, Jesus, but you need to know I don't care. As far as I'm concerned, flush them all, quit, be done. Let's go back to doing what we were doing before. Not interested. But Jesus, Jesus says, Papa, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll, I'll, uh, you can pour out your wrath on me and not on them and you see how the scenario begins to develop? And somehow we're told, I was told, I was, it's drummed into my head that when Jesus Christ went to the cross to hang on the cross, that his father poured out his wrath that was aimed at me and us onto Jesus. Okay, you see that? And now we're supposed to say thank you and we love you. Well, what, we're think, what we're thinking is, wait a minute, what happens now? Is there a chance that he could go back on it? Is there a Because his character here. His fundamental character, his judgment, his fundamental character, I'm not for you. And he poured out his wrath on Jesus and somehow Jesus twists his arm and somehow they were separated and what a load of hogwash. And what was the Holy Spirit doing during this time? Was the Holy Spirit sort of torn between two lovers? I mean, it's, it's insane. It's like, was she the mother who's trying to help the drunk dad calm down enough so he won't beat his son? I mean, this is... This is into our theology that we've inherited. And so we're wired to hear Papa call our names so that we can be free to live and free to be human and free to laugh and free to, to, uh, to, to play and free to pray. But we've got this other God all tangled in our minds and we're scared to death to let go. So that, that was what was all crammed into that moment for me all those years ago sitting in the pew and right when my Aunt Polly hit that note and my dad morphed from my dad into this rigid, ashen-faced man with no smile, and Tut Williams the same way, and Tut Williams ran a Western Auto store, and I went down there and bought all my fishing stuff and used to talk, and talk with him. And they all changed. That, that was all plugged into my soul at that point in my life. I had no clue, but I knew 
uh, as I look back, it's clear to me that I, I, had, I had been given a calling. My calling was not to be a preacher or a theologian. My calling was to find a resolution to this problem. And it's not an abstract problem. It's not a theological problem. It's our problem. It's a struggle that we have. And so um, along about the time that I discovered Athanasius, I was a senior in, in college, junior senior in college. Uh, I was in North Carolina working at a uh, summer camp and um, got up one morning and we all and we normally would have our devotions with our campers in our own cabins. But on this morning, they did the loudspeaker system. And they said, everybody's going to report to the gymnasium. We've got a special guest for morning devotions. This is seven o'clock in the morning. I got 13 year olds in my cabin. They don't go to bed till three. Anyway, we, I finally got them up and we get down there and the only seats left, of course, is the front row because <laughs> everybody else is already there. So I'm sitting on the front row right there. I kid you not. And in walks Billy Graham. I didn't know he lived right around the corner and he was friends with the camp owner. So he walks in and I, I mean, I was so stunned. It was like Moses or something, you know, it was just, <laughs> He had the hair. He's a big man, too. And he's got that uh, Virginian accent. You shall know the truth. That's what he said that morning. All I remember. And I know he wasn't looking at me because sometimes and I didn't know he wasn't looking at me till I became something of a speaker. And you stand in front of people and you're gathering your thoughts and you're thinking about what you're going to say next. And you feel like I'm just looking. I'm, I really make <laughs> my, my face. But I, anyway, he, he he says, you shall know the truth. And the truth shall set you free. And it, it was like, rocked my world. I had no clue what he meant. But I thought, that's got to be good. I knew the verse. I knew if John 8, 31, 32. I knew where, you know, but I didn't know what it meant. And it spoke to me. And from that moment on, I can look back in my journey and realize, you've been on a journey to find out what Jesus meant when he said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. So what is the truth? How do you know it? And what is this freedom? And who doesn't want it? And so my journey, and all of a sudden, you know, fast forward 10, 12 years, and I'm on the phone with Mike Fiesel and Tony Murphy and never heard of the Worldwide Church. Oh, I heard of it, but all of a sudden, you know, I'm bumping into people who are having the same journey. People and I thought, well, I'm not alone. Then I get to go to Australia and go to these places and I meet people all over the place who are on the same journey. We know here we got something that's just really out of whack. And we're scared to death because the only church we know is this church and we can't deviate from it. I mean, it was I was scared to death. If I, what are you going to do if you if you nobody ever leaves Calvinism? I mean, that's that's like if you're a Calvinist, that's like the pinnacle of all religion. So how do you move on beyond that? Where are you going? So I had, I was like, but I saw it. I saw the love of the Father in Athanasius' statement. And I saw um, his passion for us and his goodness for us. And I saw that if you, if you burrow down into the very core of God's being, where there's nothing deeper, nothing deeper, that's, that spring from which everything about God flows, what you find at that core is not that God is alone, and solitary is that God is relational. Now you can talk about the love of God all day long, but if God is eternally alone, then what's he preoccupied with from all eternity? And there's nothing there. If God is eternally alone, he doesn't know anything about being other-centered, does he? So what kind of love are we talking about from someone who's alone? And ultimately, creation is for his benefit. Either he's bored or he needs somebody to glorify him. He needs, but there's no other centeredness there. But if, you, if you're thinking about the Father, Son, and Spirit, then that's the core of God's being. Then you can't find anything deeper about God than that. Then God has always been relational. God has always been other centered. God has always been about fellowship. God has always been about shared life and about music and about harmony. And goodness defined in terms of the Trinity is good. This is a relational goodness. That's what Athanasius was saying. The God of all is good. 
Well, you can say this God, this single person God up there in the heavens, wherever, you can call that God good. But what kind of goodness is it? And is it, does it even compare to a goodness that exists within this relationship? If you call Jesus Father good, you're talking about the way he relates to his, to his son and, and the Holy Spirit. If you talk, call this God good, it's sort of abstract. I'm not sure exactly what it means. Now, I want, to, I want to take that apart a lot tomorrow. So my journey was I knew something was wrong, had no clue what it was, and I couldn't let it go. Um, I think it wouldn't let me go. And the more I uh, struggled with it, the, the worse it got. And then my senior year or junior senior year in college, I heard Billy Graham speak, say, you should know the truth and truth shall set you free. So I'm thinking, what is the truth? And how do you know it? I was hoping I was going to get a Bible verse that I could memorize. And I can point you to a Bible verse that summarizes it. And I will in just a minute. The truth is not a doctrine. The truth is not the Bible. It's not a verse. It's not a word written. The truth is a person. And he comes into our souls with his own fellowship and his own communion and his own knowledge. Hear me. He comes into our soul, your soul, with his own knowledge of his father. And that's how we can begin to believe that this God is a load of rubbish. And we can begin to trust Jesus' father. is because Jesus knows him and he's sharing what he knows with us. You with me? This is how we can have this baptism of unearthly assurance. Now, in John chapter 14, verse 20, you will find what I call the verse of all verses in the whole Bible. You guys know the Bible backwards and forwards. This verse summarizes everything. Anybody know it? Anybody know this verse? And that day you will realize that I am in you and you are in me and we are in the Father. might be a little more after that, but that's the substance. Make sure. So it's 7.13. We've got till 8. Is that right? Okay. Oh, I can go home now. <laughs> Easton, when I go to Australia, I tell them, look, man, we got a lot of hours to catch up to my time. Um, interesting. If you got a, a scripture with you, look this up. I had been wrestling and studying and thinking, trying to understand what did Jesus mean by the truth. And I had really struggled and I thought, man, I, you know, Lord, you got to take me by the hand here because I can't get this. And I felt like Jesus was taking me by the hand and saying, okay, but what you don't understand, Baxter, this is going to take you 25 years, okay? <laughs> this, is, this is not something you can do in one Bible study. And John 14, 20, and there's different ways of translating it. Your, your, transla your translations use the word realize, which has a great advantage um, in one sense. But it has the disadvantage is it doesn't use the word no. Because when it uses the word no, you shall know the truth. In that day, you shall know. You can begin to, and that's how I begin to connect the dots, just by studying the word no. And John, realize is a very important part of that. It will dawn on you. You will see this. In the day of the Holy Spirit, you are going to come to know something as being true, as being real. You don't make it real. Whether you believe it or not doesn't change it. It's something that God has created and fashioned and made in himself, and it is real. And the Holy Spirit's going to bring you to see it. And this is what we're going to see when, like Nessie, we finally look out and realize we're safe. And we cross the Jordan, we step into our own home, we look up, we're going to see this as being the absolute truth. Not just then, not just in that moment, but the truth about us all along and the truth about God all along. This is what Jesus has done, and we're blind as bats to it. And it's okay, because the Holy Spirit is on it. 
The Holy Spirit is after you to see. I talked with Paul Young a good bit because he, you know, in his book, the uh, he he has a, a portrayal of the Holy Spirit as sought of you. You remember that? How many of y'all read that book, The Shack? Some of you? Oh, all of you. See. Well, and he refers to the Holy Spirit as a her or she. So in my book, um, I got to digging around and thought, well, actually, in the Old Testament, Ruach, the word for wind and spirit, is feminine. And in the New Testament, Numa is neuter. And Jesus refers sometimes to the Holy Spirit as a he. So you have biblical precedent for a lot of diversity toward the Spirit. And so in honor of Paul and his great contribution, they're making the Holy Spirit um, conceivable and personable. I refer to the Holy Spirit in my new book as, as, as she and her. So when the Holy Spirit comes in that day, and Jesus is talking about Pentecost, which means we're in the, we're in the, you know, in the Old Testament, they had a feast of Pentecost. You with me? In Jesus, we have an age of Pentecost. Ever thought about that? Celebrate a week. Now you get an age. That's pretty cool, isn't it? And the Holy Spirit has been poured out on all flesh. And Jesus says, when the Holy Spirit comes and she carries a huge bottle of Windex, and she's squirting that over the glasses that we have on our eyes of our heart. And she's helping us to begin to see something that is already the truth about you. It's already true for you. It's already true for me. It's true about everyone on the planet. None of us see it. We're all blind as bats. We're like Nessie in the car, scared to death. We're like me running around New Orleans trying to figure out a way to save myself. But there is something that is true about you right now tonight. It has been true. And it will be true forever because this is what God has done. The Holy Spirit's trying to help us see it. Now, I want you to pay attention to those, to that one verse, and let's look at, pay attention to the three things that we're told. In that day, you will know what's the first thing that Jesus says. Come on. You will know the truth. In that day, this you will know that I am in my Father. I am in my Father. He doesn't even say with my Father. He's saying to his disciples, he's saying to us, when the Holy Spirit comes and you get to see what she has to teach you, the first thing you're going to see is that I am in my Father. Our relationship is so beautiful. Our relationship is so right. It's so unclouded with fear. And judgment, it is so holy in a proper sense of that word, not not uh, like Listerine antiseptic pure. Holy is incomparable. It means one of a kind, class by itself, nothing like it in the universe. Jesus is saying, you're going to see that my relationship with my father is so incomparable and it's so beautiful and it's so deep and it's so rich and it's so right. And good, the only way you're going to be able to describe it is to say, you're going to see me. I'm in my father. The father's in me. It's that, it's that beautiful and that good. I think it's fascinating. Here you are. Here I was studying, trying to find the answer. What is the truth that sets us free? And the first thing Jesus says, it's got nothing to do with you. I mean, this is there's some serious liberation in this for us. We're so beaten down because we've not done it right. We hadn't been there. We've had all kinds of problems in our lives. All kinds of things have happened to all of us, some worse than others. We've had the crap beat out of us in one way or another, right? And we're scared. And we know we're, we're like the Pharisee that comes in. It can't, I mean, the, the, the broken man that comes in. The Pharisee says, oh, thank you, oh God, that I am. And the, and the other man is just so broken. He's just like, man, if you let me in the door, I'm, I'm so ashamed and I'm so beaten down. I can't even begin to look up at you. Because I know I'm no good. I know I'm unworthy. I know I have failed. I know that I've done wrong. So I, I'm not even worth. So we, we walk into the room with a verdict over us that we've passed on ourselves. And we think that God's got to honor that verdict. So God, you know, maybe let us in. And the first thing we encounter is we see Jesus in his Father. We're just totally taken out of ourselves. 
We're not thinking about us. We're not thinking about what we've done, good or bad. We're not thinking about blessed. We're not thinking about trauma. We're not thinking about the abuse. We suddenly, our eyes are fixed on Jesus and we see that relationship that he has with his father. And it's so beautiful. And we see that we, that Jesus is in his father. That's what we see when the Holy Spirit comes. This is what the Holy Spirit's been trying to teach the whole human race for the last 2,000 years. And it looks like, perhaps, it looks like we're going to be in, we are right now in one of those moments where the kaleidoscope turns. Historically, there, there are periods like that in history where the kaleidoscope turns and all of a sudden bunches of people begin to see things differently and you begin to see them differently together. I think that's what's going on. But first and foremost, you need to understand that what is true about you and about me and about the human race, and we didn't vote on this, we didn't make this happen, we can't do anything to undo it, is that Jesus is in his Father, in his, in his father and the Father's in him. You remember Stephen, the first martyr of the church? What do you see? What do you see? <laughs> Can you not? There it is. Right, like you, I mean, he got to see it first. The brother that gave up his life for Jesus first in terms of uh, the Christian uh, after Pentecost. Is that not beautiful? I see that heaven's open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God, Jesus. Now, you don't think that gave Stephen hope? You see... It didn't have anything to do with Stephen. He, he wasn't saying, I'm here, Jesus. I'm sacrificing for my life. Let me in, please. The first thing he got to see was that Jesus is with his father. And he was there as a human being. Now, I want to come back to that tomorrow. He's there as a human being. He will be human forever and ever at his father's right hand. Quick note on that. So that he can share everything that he has with his father and Holy Spirit with the rest of his human family. It's on our level. We don't even have to climb up there. He's come down to bring it to us. First thing we'll see, it's, it's not about you and your relationship with God. In fact, I would say to you, not that I would ever put anything scandalously, but I would say to you that you do not and never have and never will have a relationship with God. You're included in Jesus' relationship. And if you get that, you will quit, quit taking yourselves so seriously and start being free to participate in Jesus' relationship. Because that relationship's right. That relationship's good. That relationship's beautiful. That relationship's stable. Quick quote from George MacDonald. Um, he says, as long, as long as the Son loves the Father with all the love the Father can stand, all is well with the little ones. You see? As long as that relationship is good, we're okay. We're going to get there. You see it? So I think in our Western family conversation, we've got one God is the Father, Son, and Spirit. We really don't know what to do with that. We like it, but it scares us because it's so different than this God. And this God is up on the throne, and we're all, in Christianity, has been reduced to um a, a relationship with a God who watches us from the distance and has given us a bunch of things that we're supposed to do for this God and this God's glory. You with me? Y'all know anything about that? <laughs> but it's distant and it's all about external behaviors and right words and all this stuff. And Jesus is saying, no, no, Pharisees, no, 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 no. Stop, 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 stop. First thing you're going to see is that I'm in my Father. That's the key. That's, that's the first part of the truth that is true whether you see it or not, whether you believe it or not. Whether you get it or not, it's the truth. And it will be revealed to the human race when Jesus, I mean, when the Holy Spirit um, bring, I mean, accomplishes her full mission. And then Jesus goes on to say two more things that are even more mind-blowing. <coughs> What's the next thing he says? Where are we? Now, he hadn't asked us to believe or to repent or to get religious. What Jesus is saying to his disciples is, look, I know. Get this, boys. You all are going to tuck tail and run. You're fixing to scatter. Every one of you will betray me. Every one of you will walk away from me. And he could have gone on a roll and that say, you're unbelievers. You don't believe in me yet. But that's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying when the Holy Spirit comes, you're going to see that I'm in the Father and you're going to see that you're, that I'm, that you're in me. 
Still, we're still not talking about what we do yet. Please hear me. We're not talking about what we do. We're not talking about whether we do it good enough or right enough or if we've been at it long enough. We're talking about something that is true, bigger than us, that the, the blessed Father, Son, and Spirit has made real, and we're included in it. Now, Jesus says the second thing you're going to discover is that not only am I and my Father, you're going to begin to see that you're not outside looking in, hoping to figure out some way that you can manage to get up there and be in that relationship, that you're actually already included. And I'm the one that has included you. The truth that sets us free is about Jesus' relationship with his Father and about the fact that he has gathered together the human race and taken us with him. Now, I was wrestling with these concepts way back in Scotland when I was studying with Professor Torrance. And I, I, it was one of those deals where you, you see it, but you can't even begin to say it. You, you, I mean, you, you can see it. It's so beautiful. It's so clear, but you can't. And I was wrestling. I was struggling. And uh, my brother, Stephen, was coming over uh, to play golf. And so I was meeting him at the Aberdeen Airport. And I was sitting at the table, I mean, a little uh, chair watching, reading the newspaper. And all of a sudden, the plane taxis over the terminal, and, and I look up, and standing over here is a little, there's a man about my age, but in his mid 30s at that time, something like that. And he was standing there, and he would look out the window, and he would walk over and check out the, the monitors, and he'd check his watch, and he'd come back over here. And there are people everywhere. But I was just reading my newspaper, and for whatever reason, I just took notice to him, of him. And before long, the plane taxied over, and and the little jetway went out, and Folks started kind of opening up two double doors and folks started coming off the plane. And some were in a hurry and some were glad to be back home. And some were looking around like, well, where am I? Where's the baggage claim? Where's the bathroom? Um, and then all of a sudden, it wasn't anybody there anymore. And the man was standing there and he was looking at his watch and you could tell he was beginning to be a little sad. He was concerned. And then there's a little boy, 10, 11 years old, that appears in the double doors <coughs> and he's standing there like an alarmed deer. And he's looking, he's looking around like this. And his father said something to him. I couldn't tell what it was. I assumed it was his name. And the little boy started running across the airport. And for me, sitting over here, I had the perfect seat. It was like uh, an Einsteinian relativity moment. It's like everything just slowed down. And I watched this little boy running with this huge grin on his face. And his father standing there with arms open wide like this. And that little boy dropped, dropped his bag in one motion. He dropped his bag, jumped in the air, and his father called him all at one time. And was standing there, were holding each other, and they kissed each other on the cheek, and there were tears of joy, and there was that embrace. And that's what got my attention, was just the way they embraced one another. And I was sitting right over there, and this ticker tape went across the front of my mind, and it said, Baxter, Baxter, that is the gospel. That is the truth that sets you free. That little boy is Jesus coming from the far country. And that is his resurrection. And that is his ascension. And there you're looking at our embrace. And the good news, Baxter, is he has you and the whole world with him. Okay. You with me? In that day, you're going to see that this is already done. And we can put our ledgers down and we can treat Quit trying to figure out how to get to God and make sure we get it right. And quit thinking less of others that can't quite do it as good as we do, perhaps. We're going to be embarrassed in a good way. It's family embarrassment. We're going to see it. And we're going to think, oh, Lord, how many years did I spend fretting and worried and scared to death and biting my fingernails? I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. Can I get there? I tell that story all over the world. I, I must have told it a dozen times in Australia, but the first time I told it, this young girl named Stephanie, I sat, told in the end of the lecture, and I told the story, and I sat down. And all of a sudden, I hear this crying coming down the aisle. Mr. Kruger, Mr. Kruger. And I looked up, and it was Stephanie, and I knew Stephanie. I had met her several times, and she was a good friend of mine. Uh, she was about 12 at the time, I think. And she was crying, and she came and sat right beside me, and I put my arm around. I said, Stephanie, what is wrong? I was thinking, you know, when you travel internationally, you, you can say things that are typical sort of Americanisms, but they don't work there. <laughs> they mean something other than. And uh, anyway, 
I thought, well, I said something bad and hurt her feelings or something. And anyway, she said, nothing is wrong, Mr. Krueger, nothing is wrong. She said, the Lord gave me a vision. I said, what are you talking about? She said, when you told the, little boy, the story of the little boy in the airport, I saw a vision. And I said, Stephanie, what was it? She said, I saw God on the throne. And he was high and lifted up and he was on the throne. There were steps leading to him. And we were all trying to get to God and there were heaps of people all on the steps and none of us could get to God and we were all broken and sad and exhausted and our knees were bloody and our fingers were bloody and our elbows were bloody and we could not get to God. And I said, well, did you see something else? She said, yes, sir, I saw Jesus. And I said, what did Jesus do? She said, Jesus walked over and picked us all up in his arms, walked up the steps and sat down in his father's lap. Mm. And in, in that day, we're going to see that he's in the Father and he's already included us. It will be an embarrassment, embarrassing liberation. You with me? It'll be good. But you see, we have a lot invested in what we think we've got to do to get to God. And it's hard to let that go, isn't it? Isn't it hard to let go for some of us? Some of us are so crashed and burned, we're like, man, I, if that's the way, pff, count me out. But some of us are pretty sure we're doing a good job at this. And it's hard to let that go. We've been at this 30, 40, 50 years. We sit on the third pew, you know. In that day, we're going to see that Jesus is in the Father and we're in Him. And He has done this. He has done this. Maybe tomorrow I can give you a little bit more of the biblical and theological rationale for how that works. But I like the stories first. And the stories, you know, they're true. I don't have to argue with the Bible. You may need some Bible verses to go with it. But you, do you not feel that there in your soul? It's too good to be true, isn't it? It can't be that good. <laughs> what, what if Jesus' Father sitting on the throne said, I'm not resting till you get them back? What if Jesus' Father has not been on the throne, but he's been pacing in heaven saying, Jesus, when are you bringing my family back? What if that's the way? What if this is his, his idea? What if Paul was right and says that we were chosen before the foundation of the world to be adopted as sons through Jesus? We'll look at that verse tomorrow, that chapter tomorrow. But we've only begun to scratch the surface on the truth because there's a third thing. Did you notice it? Jesus is in the Father. We're in Him. And... Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, the point, when I first saw that, I can remember. I wrote a book called Home years ago. I don't know if you see it. It's a free, you can download it free now on our website. And I, it was on John 14, 20. Among other, I mean, that was the main part of it. And I got to this third thing, and I, I was sitting there thinking, that, that can't be. <laughs> this can't be true before I vote. I mean, this can't be true before I repent and believe and win the victory. I mean, it can't be that Jesus is already in me. You know, and I remember thinking, and I hear this all the time in my part of the world. I hear Rick people, uh, TV preachers, radio preachers, and they will say, you need to pray to receive Jesus into your life. Ever heard that? I think I know what they're trying to, to do. But I also think that's a very terrible way of putting it. The gospel is not the news that you can receive Jesus into your life. The gospel is the news that Jesus has received you into His. See the difference? He has received you into His life. Now what are you going to do with that? Are you going to keep trying to live your own life? Or you want to say, I'm in, I win, teach me how to live in this, teach me how to live in this. I don't want to do it my way anymore. I'm tired of making a mess of things. I'm tired of the religion that I created. I want to be in, I'm in that relationship and I want to know it and I want to feel it. And I don't want to see anybody anywhere in the, in the whole cosmos in any way other than the way they are in Jesus. And I want to see him with the eyes of the Father, Son, and Spirit. And I want everybody else to see that way. And I want us to begin to live not in fear and insecurity like my dog, worried about tomorrow, begin to live in peace and hope. And begin to be able to be free to care about other people more than I even do myself. Jesus says, in that day, you're going to see that I am in my Father and you're in me. And I am already in you. 
That rocked my world. So when I look back, I see that event on Sunday morning, which I know was not just one event, that was, had been brewing in me for a while. I was torn. I was in church to worship God. I wanted to be out there with my dad and his friends because that was life. And I don't know what we were calling this. But I knew that wasn't life. There was life. And that put a burr under my saddle. And then Billy Graham, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Then Athanasius, the God of all, is, is good and supremely noble by nature. Therefore, he is the lover of the human race. And that came. And then I got to study eventually under Professor James Torrance, and he was hammering on all this. And then John 14, 20 just sort of just stood out at me and begged for some serious thought. But I had a hard time. I had the hardest time with the last clause because I couldn't believe that this could be true. Because in my mindset, and perhaps you're different, in my mindset, God's up on the throne and we're down here and he's watching us. So how can it be that he's already in me and in you? And I think in the whole human race, irrespective, irrespective of what they think and understand and know right now. I've got to give the Holy Spirit another 50 millennia so she can straighten out what's real in our minds. But we're talking about what's real in reality, not not what kind of glasses we got on. That's what faith and repentance is. Faith and repentance is getting your glasses right. So you can see what's real. We're talking about what's real, whether we see it or not. And so I was wrestling with this. And one day, my son, who's now 23, he's six foot five, big dude. But he was little then. He's probably about seven years old. And they're making a YouTube video out of this story. It's supposed to be out in the next couple of months. Um, but I was sitting in the den on Saturday afternoon sorting through junk mail. Getting ready to watch a football game. And I was sitting like right here. There was a door right there. And I hear some rumbling or whatever. I look over and out of the corner of my eye. I see two little boys' heads peering around the door. Face paint and camouflage hat. And I look at them like this. And the next thing I know, there's two camouflage blurs shot like out of a cannon. They come flying across the room. They hit me on the couch in the, in the fight zone. So we go through about 10 minutes of mock war fighting all that and machine gun <laughs> grenades. I died 15 times, you know, and eventually we ended up in a pile of laughter on the floor. And right in the middle of that, I, get, I got another one of these ticker tape things. It said back to pay attention. This is important. I'm thinking Saturday afternoon. Dad's in the den getting ready to watch a football game. His son and his buddy come in. They end up horsing around playing army. What, what's the big deal about that? And it took me a while to process it before I began to realize what I was being given to see. Because if you, the truth is, I, I had never even seen this other little boy. I didn't know his name. And if you rewind the story and you tell it this way, you can begin to see it. Let's just say this other little boy peered out from around the corner. My son's back in the back with Nessie playing. And this other little boy stands there and looks at me. He's got face paint on. He's got, you know, plastic grenades and knives and camouflage. And he sees me. He probably would think I'm Mr. Kruger, but he wouldn't be sure. But alone, by himself, the last thing in the world he's ever going to do is just come flying through the air and hit Mr. Kruger and get into this mock fight and end up in a pile of laughter on the floor. And that's when it began to dawn on me that my son knows me. He knows that I love him. He knows that I like him. He knows that he's one of the apples of my eye. He knows that he's always wanted and he's always welcomed. And in the freedom of his knowledge of my heart, he did the most natural thing in the world, which is to come and engage me in play. And I watched my son's knowledge of my heart go inside that other little boy. I saw my son's freedom with me go inside that other little boy. And he got to taste and feel and experience our life together. You with me? I saw our joy go inside that other little boy, and I didn't even know his name. Since I remembered it was Steve, and I asked my son about that. That rocked my world. I'm thinking, I get this, I get this, I get this. And then at that point for me in my journey, I began to be able to see things differently. I begin to see people differently. 
I try, I want to see people in the light of the truth that sets us all free. It is true before you believe it. It's happening. You now are going to begin to understand what your motherhood is about, what your sacrifice is about. You're now going to begin to understand what your burden's about. I had a friend of mine call one time. He was a pastor of a church and there had been a terrible tragedy in the church. I think a, a father of four had died at the breakfast table. Some sort of heart problem or something. I'm not sure what it was. But the family, the wife and four children were of course plunged into utter, utter grief. And the whole church community was just, just burdened down for this family. And this friend called me and he said, Baxter, I just don't get this. He said, he said, where was, where is God in all this? Here I am burdened down with this family. I can hardly breathe. And where is God in all of this? And I said to him, well, I said, there's two questions there. One is, why did God let this happen? And nobody knows the answer to that. And the second question is, you're asking, where is God in the middle of the tragedy now that we're, that it's happened? And I said to my friend, I asked him a question. I said, are you suggesting to me that this burden that you feel in your heart and this grief that this congregation feels originates in you? Are you telling me that this is your burden? Are you telling me that this grief that this congregation feels for this family is their grief? I think this would be the grief of the Good Shepherd. I think this would be the burden of the Father, Son, and Spirit being shared with us. And it is so close to us, we don't have eyes to see it. You with me? Now, what if that's the secret of our music? What if that's the secret of our motherhood? What if that's the secret of our gardening and our golf? What if that's the secret of our passion, of a concern for the planet? That on the plane going one year from Dallas out to uh, somewhere in the northeast, northwest, and... Um, it was way back, a long time ago. It was the first time I'd ever flown over the Rocky Mountains, and I'd never seen them at that time, so I wanted to get a window seat, and I did. And it turned out that every seat in the plane, every other seat was empty, so everybody had space. And I was back on Rock 25 or 26, kind of back in the back of the plane. And the, and the flight attendant closed the door, and we backed out about 10 <coughs> feet and then stopped and then pulled forward again, and the door flung open. And, and this guy gets on the plane, looks like Indiana Jones, with a <laughs> leather hat and leather satchel, leather jacket. And he starts walking back, and I'm thinking, I, I just knew where he was going to sit. There's all these empty seats. And he sat right beside me, and he introduced himself as a, as a systematic microevolutionary biologist who had been on a trip in the Caribbean. He was very concerned about plants becoming extinct, species of plants that have become extinct and those that were becoming extinct and what we must do to save them. And... and um, he pulled out a napkin, napkin and drew diagrams and had Latin names and all this. He was a very, very passionate man. I mean, he drew me in. I really started caring about plants. I'm like, I ain't never heard of that. I mean, I didn't think about that. So anyway, somewhere over Idaho, he gets done and he says, so I guess you being a theologian, you want to ask me about evolution. And I said, I said, no, I said, I don't really care about evolution, but I do have a question. He said, what's that? And I said, where? Did you get your passion for plants? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, was your Uncle Uncle Freddie a botanist? Your mom and dad botanist? Did you just wake up one day and decide you were going to dedicate yourself to plants? And he said, I had never thought about it. And I said, well, I know the origin of your burden for plants. There's only one circle of love and concern and care in this universe, and that's the Father, Son, and Spirit. And Jesus himself is putting his concern for his creation in your soul, and you've been tooling around the Caribbean in his passion, caring about his creation. And you're not even sure if God exists. And I will never forget the next moment. He looked at me and he said, well, if that's true, why haven't I ever been told? And I said, you just were. <laughs> now, now, what are you going to do with this? You see, that's where the truth comes in as light. But it exposes our pride because that fellow felt he's doing a pretty good thing. And now he begins to see that he's a part of something much larger than him and beautiful. 
But that truth exposes and causes us to what are we going to believe now that we've seen this? Are we going to take a step in that direction or are we going to say no? That's the interplay between faith and repentance that the New Testament calls to. But never for one minute let it be missed that this is what's true. And this is what the Holy Spirit's revealing to us is true. And this is what we're learning to believe and learning to take baby steps of trust in. That we have been so loved forever that the Father has um, sent Jesus to find us. And he has and he's included us in his relationship. And he's done such a good job of including us in his relationship that it's already at work in you and me. And when you see that in people, you will begin to see the life and the glory and the beauty and the goodness and the other centeredness and the freedom and the fellowship of the Father, Son and Spirit. You will begin to see that in people's faces and you will see that in you'll see that in, the, in a one year old toddler who is trying to learn to walk. It is the life of the blessed Trinity coming to expression in that little toddler. And you can affirm it and you can nurture it and you can help it and you can see it in people who are broken. Jean Vanier, one of the great uh, I, I, pastors, ministers, Christian men of our day, I heard him in Canada speak, and he has given his life to care for people at a place called La Arche in, in um, France, and they take anybody that, that gets left off at the door, all the outcasts, all the I can't handle this, can't do it, or whatever. And he stood up to do a session in Toronto, Canada, and he said, he said, Christian ministry is meeting Jesus inside other people's brokenness. When you begin to see Jesus in people's brokenness and in their broken lives, you begin to have hope for them because the Father, Son, and Spirit are there. They're included. That life is there, and it's trying to come out. I saw a weed in Dallas on the runway. Nothing but asphalt. There was a piece of a plant of something that came popping up through it. And I thought, life fights to live. Trinitarian life in us is going to come out. It fights to live. Christian ministries, when you look inside of people, not just church people, people, and you see that life trying to come out in their brokenness and in their pain and in their hurt. And your, your gift and your joy is to help nurture that. And let it come out because it will be bigger and wider and more beautiful than anything we dared to dream. And like idiots, excuse me, we're running around telling people they're outside and here's what they must do to get inside. And once you get inside, here's the rules and regulations to make you look like a Christian. We're going to be embarrassed in a really good way. We might as well be embarrassed now. And go on and get it over with because it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. We're going to see who Jesus really is. And we're going to think, whoa, did I ever think I was, I was doing good. All right, one last story. Um, when I was in college, in this period where I discovered Athanasius and I was all excited. And I was trying to learn. The, there was a retreat put on by one of the, the campus um, college ministries. And some really great preacher was coming. Everybody was all fired up to go. So they invited us to go. Of course, every guy went for the girls. Not that, not that the girls went for God. I don't know. But anyway, college retreat it was really good. This guy gets up first night. <laughs> it's a big fella. He stands up and he says, God is keeping a video of your life, of everything you've done, thought, not thought, everything you said. And when you die, he's going to make you play that video on the big screen in front of your grandmother. <laughs> and the big screen in front of everybody's going to see what you were thinking about and who you really were and what a scoundrel and scallywag you were. And of course, everybody older than 13 in the room said, please tell me that there's an eraser. <laughs> you know, how do so, I mean, manipulation, shame, the whole thing. He's trying to get everybody to jump through the hoop so that we can pray and get saved and get, you know, all, all through this stuff. Anyway, I've thought about that over the years. And so I've come up with a little slightly different version. So when we die and wake up, Jesus meets us and he hands us a DVD uh, or whatever technology we have at that particular time. And he does this privately because Jesus just does not end the shame. And he likes a good joke. And he likes family embarrassment where we're all laughing with each other, but he's not into shame. If you feel ashamed, that comes straight from Diabolos, not from Jesus and not from the Holy Spirit. 
this circle of life from the Father, Son, and Spirit is very tender and very gentle and loves us under freedom. Anyway, you get a DVD that says your life and contribution to the kingdom of God. And there's a TV screen over here and it's a private view and just you and Jesus. And the Holy Spirit's around, you know. Anyway, you put the DVD in the screen and you hit play and you step back and blue screen comes up, you know. And you sit there and you're looking at it and it stays blue. It stays blue. And you go over and hit play again because it couldn't possibly be just blue. I mean, we're talking about my life and contribution to the kingdom here, aren't we? <laughs> so about the time about the time we get upset with Jesus for being unfair, he comes over and hands us another DVD. And this one says, not you, but Christ in you. And you get to put that in and you get to see your entire life from his perspective, from the not just from the moment of your conception, but from all eternity. And then the moment of your conception, and you get to see your burdens and your joys and your uh, concerns and your griefs and your loves and your passions and your creativity and your relationships. You get to see all of that as the life of the Father, Son, and Spirit seeking to come to expression in you. And you'll see it. And it will be beautiful. And you can see how they have been nurturing this from before you were born and before you knew to even vote that you've been included in their life. And that's the truth that sets us free. Amen. We got time for questions or we got to wrap up? No, we got time for questions. What time is it? Oh, okay. We got seven, seven minutes. <clears throat> that's good. That's good. En- that's good enough for. No, just comments or thoughts. It doesn't have to be a question. Comments or thoughts. You know, I, I'm rushing from the Old Testament and I read the New Testament and I see the New Testament very loving this loving relationship between the Father and the Son. And you read the Old Testament and you see the children of Israel on the mountain and, and they're just killing with the, with the quails. Blood and guts. Yeah, the blood and guts. And <laughs> now what I'd like to see you do by Mr. this weekend is how you kind of reconcile the two. She's talking about the difference between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament, how you reconcile those two things. That's a huge question. There's a new book out on that. I haven't read it, but it looked good, by, put out by InterVarsity on wrestling with that. But let me just make one quick point. Um, there are passages. I mean, you, you remember the movie, I think it was called Outbreak, where it was somewhere in Africa and there, there was it's the Ebola virus and it was spreading. And, and they knew that this thing is fixing to kill all of Africa and this is going to spread around the world. This is, and so as an act of extreme um, grace, they had to drop one of those air bombs, fire bombs, to blow up over the village and everybody within it was incinerated. And that's what they had to do to kill the Ebola virus. And I was watching that movie and I thought, what? I thought, well, what if you have these places in the Old Testament where in to the mind of the Father, Son, and Spirit, the situation is so desperate that there's no way we're actually going to be able to pull off the incarnation and adoption unless we take some extreme measures here and move some things out of play so that this redeeming line can continue to develop. Because if this thing dies out, there's no incarnation. There's There's no line. And so I've been thinking about the Old Testament in that light over the years, and that's helped me. Because I see a lot more of the passion of the Father. And, and so when you see these people in the movie incinerated, that does not mean, therefore, they're now burning in hell forever and ever and ever. It means that because of what was happening, they had to be removed from this particular situation. And I think a lot of that helps us understand some of the Old Testament. A huge discussion. Huge discussion. And I've got some thoughts on Genesis 6, too. That yeah, I think the name of that book, uh, I just picked it up here a while back. It's called, Is God a Moral Monster? It sounds right. And the second half of that book goes into all of that Old Testament stuff. And uh, I haven't read that part yet, but I think that's the, the book if anybody's interested. The in. other thing to realize is, and maybe we can develop this a little bit more, but we tend to think of Abraham and Israel as being um, God called them and then they listened to God and every time God spoke, they got it. But when you look at it 
from a larger biblical perspective, Abraham was called because, not because of his religious potential, but because he was a pagan like everybody else. He was as blind as everybody else. And so God <laughs> said, I'm going to take this man, and if I can reach him, I've got a way of reaching others. And so Abraham, it, it takes him a long time to even begin to get to grips with who God really is. And so the whole Old Testament, God is trying to say, this is who I am. And, and they're saying, oh, no, you're not. Oh, no, you're not. Oh, no, you're not. So there's a lot of dynamic that's going on there that raises questions. Well, what, when's God really speaking here? Is when is it people that are scared of him and, and attributing things to him? So it's, it creates a very dynamic tension when you're trying to study the Old Testament. Because Jesus is the full and final revelation. <laughs> You know, it's like to me when you read a novel and you're clipping along and you got the story and you got the characters and you got you think you got this thing figured out, and then boom, there's a twist and you didn't see it coming, and all of a sudden you think, God, I got to go back and reread this thing now. So, so the twist, the twist is Jesus. That's when we see who God really is. This is a struggle to understand. Then we go back, like Jesus says, and interpret Moses and the law, Moses and the law and the prophets in the light of Him. That throws a lot of stuff up in the air. Seems like it makes it really relational. You know, it seems like then we read the Old Testament saying, Holy Spirit, please help me see. All right, we've got just a few more minutes. A couple other comments, questions? Doesn't have to be questions, comments, thoughts, ideas. The second coming, everybody talks about that. The second coming of Christ. The second coming of Jesus? Yeah. Man, y'all jump right on in, don't you? <laughs> Here's my rule on the second coming. Whatever you say, about the second coming of Jesus, it cannot assume he's not here now. We're dealing with blindness. He's not moving from absence to presence. It's all about the Holy Spirit giving us eyes to see and ears to hear. There's a lot more going on here than we have eyes to see, but we're going to see it. We're going to see it. And we're going to be embarrassed and we're going to say, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'll have more, please. <laughs> oh, Lord. When we meet Jesus face to face, we're not going to look at him and say, man, I really overestimated you. 